Later, in this unique documentary, we take a journey to the fascinating Dragon Oak and a walk up to the sacred Longstone and listen to her story. So first of all, I'll introduce myself for people who don't know me. My name is Jan Harper Whale. The name Whale is significant, but we'll find out about that later. Um, I came to the island in 1976. I came from London. I had a wallet full of plastic that dripped to the floor and not a spiritual genome in my body. But the island soon saw to that, because once the spiritual door is opened to you, it doesn't close. And so from 1976, through an event that I won't go into, but spirit came to me, I started the journey and it has continued and it will continue along the way. And coming to the island, I found it a very, very powerful place to be. And I just wanted to ask you a question because this relates specifically as to why I'm here. I just wanted to know how many of you felt that you were drawn to the island. You found yourself here. Some of you didn't know why, but you were drawn here all the same and found yourself working like I am on a spiritual path or getting to that place where you felt you connected to the island in a spiritual way. So, show of hands, anybody? Wow. It's like I've always said, we have a huge spiritual community on the island growing. And so, um, I wanted to start to give you as much information of the research that I have done over the last four years to bring me to the point where I could write this book. And it's archaeological evidence, it's linguistic evidence, and it's DNA, microchondial DNA evidence. It's taken an awful lot of searching. Clues put together, then more clues to find a story that hasn't been told. It's about a suppressed history and it's about a rediscovering an entire race of people on the Isle of Wight, and this is her story. So, from a brief summary, it's, it's about how Christian missionaries came to Britain uh, to come and convert pagan people. And to get to that point of real understanding just how inclusive it was in that, I'll give you some facts. Um, I'll also give you, to start off with, um, a spiritual story because this book is very spiritually based and it comes from an event that happened back in 1990-something. It's sort of like nine or five or six. And I was making my first journey up to the Longstone. Now, we all know how the Longstone invites you or repels you. It took me three journeys to find it, so I was getting pretty miffed thinking I wasn't going to find it. You take the wrong left and you find yourself at the barrow. You take that and you find yourself somewhere else. The day that I actually did make it, I put my hand on the long stone and I wasn't there in this time anymore. I was somewhere else. And whoever I was, I was facing the last moments of my life because before me was a man with a mask, a, a, a <coughs> metal mask full of engraving. Um, it was a helmet. And I will never forget his eyes because his eyes were black and they were full of killing. 
he was from the killing fields and he was about to end the life of this spirit that I had come to see and it was horrific. I gave it up. I walked away from it and thought, well, that's why people don't like the long stone. If that's what it's holding, you can keep it, thank you very much. But several years later, and this shows you how they actually work on you so wonderfully well, I was up there again and I touched the long stone and there I saw this huge warriors, this whole army coming over Chessel Down. And this was the battle that has been suppressed. And then she showed me where she's buried. And she was buried in a place that years later, when I was up with Morris, up at the Longstone Cottage, which is where that photograph comes from, because I took it on an early winter morning and I saw that figure in a photograph, he took me to her burial mound. Now the thing is, and this is the wonderment, is that when she showed me where she was buried, it was at winter and all the leaves were on the ground. So as we started walking up Brystone Forest, I suddenly recognised this is what I'd seen. And when we came to her burial mound there, a disc burial mound in the middle of Brystone Forest, I knew. I was actually being shown something real. And so a good friend, that, I mean, this put me, this put me right off because I thought Bronze Age, I'm looking at something like, did Venetians come over here and do this? Where's it coming from? And I put it to side. And then <coughs> one day a friend said, well, do you know, there has been known that Anglo-Saxon royalty or, or important people were actually buried in Bronze Age age burial mounds and that kind of clicked something for me because I started looking at the Anglo-Saxon period and when I came upon the Sutton Who mask which is in this book here and I, I've got it covered up because it I just can't look at it there it was that was the mask that I saw and so I was looking at something that happened a lot later than I was researching and so I started to look into this massacre of 686 AD when Cadwalla came over with Wil St. Wilfred and he massacred all the people here. And that has caused a vacuum in our energy of the island, in our history of the island. And that vacuum is something that people want to fill. Nature hates a vacuum. We abhor a vacuum. We need to fill it. And so there has been so many different stories, myths, legends that have surrounded this. And I wanted to find out a lot more about it if I could. Because if I could was the thing. Dark ages, there's not a lot of information out there. And what I have discovered is that the information given has been ma majorly done by um, clerical monks, Christian monks, who wrote the history of Britain at least two, sometimes three centuries after the fact. And those are the only, or at least I thought, only the chroniclers that we had about our history. And so I started to look further afield. <laughs> the Longstone is full of crystals. <coughs> Um, all of the ancient stones are full of crystals. Our computers are crystals. And so for our ancestors, and now for us who can feel they are the computers of the ancient times, because a crystal actually is a transmitter, transducer and receiver. Therefore, if you have crystals in the ancient stones, they are going to be doing that job that this does. We just need to connect. So... <clears throat> Um, searching around the traditional established facts. Who were the Wiktwara? Um, I'll just say Gildas, <coughs> 510 to 530 AD. He's the first historical writer on the ruin and conquest of Britain. And he wrote in a polemic in a ranting style. I've given him another name. I call him St Gildas the Murdoch of the sun because a lot of his writings were done 
from his own imagination, from his own take, yeah? And we all know Murdoch, we don't need to go any more into that, but heaven help us if there is an ST put in front of his name. And of the supposed invasion, he writes, of the Anglo-Saxons that were meant to have invaded in 410 AD or 420 AD, he says, a pack of cubs burst forth from the lair of the barbarian lioness, mm -hmm. Nethos, coming in three keel, as they call warships in their language. High proud keel and sail ocean going boats were being created before the Vikings in the Cimbrian Peninsula, which I'll come to in a minute. So, St Gildas, Murdoch, heaven help us, da -da -da. he begins, he carries on to write about the invasion as this. For the fire of vengeance, justly kindled by former crimes spread from sea to sea, fed by the hands of impious Easterners who did not cease until destroying neighbouring towns and lands, it reached the other side of the island and dipped its red and savage tongue in the Western Ocean. Not even to this day are cities of our country inhabited as before, but deserted and dismantled and neglected. What a spin! because archaeology has shown that nearly all major towns in Roman Britain at that time had shown evidence of continuity and sometimes even major construction well into the 5th century. So I'm of the belief that Gildas, the Murdoch, is responsible for the, for the propaganda surrounding the Anglo-Saxon slash and burn invasion in 410 AD and there isn't a lot of archaeological evidence of mass graves or the diminishment of language, which is an important one, because language exists by the people who speak it. And our Anglo-Saxon language is absolutely everywhere. Uh, Francis Pryor, who's of the time team people, firmly believes in a gradual, passive assimilation of the Suevi. I'll come to that in a minute, and the Britons, so they merged and came together peaceably in most cases. We're not saying all, but most. So, <clears throat> with the origins of the British, Stephen Oppenheimer, this was the breakthrough book by this lovely guy, I do recommend, because he takes it from the Ice Age right through. And he takes it that as soon as the ice melted, human beings, Homo sapiens, started to walk. Wouldn't you? You know? And, and so they migrated. And what he discovered with the linguistics in particular, and also the physiognomy, is that the Celtic peoples migrated up through the Basque country, and in the Basque region, there is some still Celtic language being spoken. So we're looking at the origin of people here. And they migrated up the western side, they migrated up through France, who went into Cornwall, Wales, Ireland, and that is where they spread right through to Wales. But on the eastern coast, there is more evidence to show that the Anglo-Saxon, which I will put you right on in a minute, because it wasn't Anglo-Saxon at all, they came and migrated from the eastern side, came down the coast and came through to Kent, the Isle of Wight, and the Meon Valley, and they settled in East Anglia, so we have this mix of people in Britain. So Tacitus, this Roman chronicler who trained in Rome, um, who was 64 when he died, he did a lot of writing, and um, this is jumping, thank you. Uh, he wrote the Agricola and the Germania in 70 AD, <clears throat> was he half Germanic? There is some theory about that. Um, but he wrote eloquently and he also wrote without a spin. He did not have an agenda. He prided himself on observation. And I've put a lot of um, faith in this guy, actually, because what he proposed, he was very kind about the descriptions that he gave of the Suevi. That is the true name of the Germans. Actually, Germania was something that the Romans made up, but they actually called themselves the Suevi, and they were hugely 
all over the place. That's the old name. And the Swervia Confederacy of Seven lived in the Kimbrick Peninsula. And they're the Avion, the Rudinians, the Angli, the Warini, Eudosi, Sakoni, and Neothone. Now within that group are two really special tribe nations. One is the uh, Yudose, because that is the real name of the Jutes. The other one is the Angli, and that is the real name of the Anglo. So within this group, you have two of the original invaders already within this confederacy. Um, and Tacitus goes on to say, I concur in opinion with those who deem the Germans never to have intermarried with other nations, but to be a race pure, unmixed and stamped with a distinct character. Hence the likeness pervades the whole through the numbers. They were pastoralist hunter-gatherers. They were protein rich, so they were very large boned and extremely tall. They were a race of giants. And we have found archeological evidence of giants on the island and also along the south coast. So there's more proof that they came here. That's a time team broadcast. Nothing remarkable happened with the Confederacy of Seven except they unite in the worship of Nethos, the Earth Mother. They were peaceable people. And suppose her to interfere in the affairs of men and to visit the different nations in an island, <laughs> in an island of an ocean. Now get this, because the Kimbrick Peninsula is actually sticks out but there has been suggestion that that island of an ocean, we're actually talking about Britain. There is an awful lot of evidence building that Nethos was a major, major, major religion here. Stands a sacred and unviolated grove in which is a consecrated chariot. Consecrated chariot covered with a veil which the priest alone is permitted to touch. He becomes conscious of the entrance of the goddess in this secret recess with a profound veneration attends the vehicle which is drawn by oxen. And at this season all is joy. In every place which the goddess deigns to visit there is a scene of festivity. No wars are undertaken. Arms are untouched and every hostile weapon is shut up. Peace abroad and at home are then only known, and then only love till at length the same priest reconducts the goddess to her temple, the chariot with its curtain, if we may believe it, the goddess herself undergoes ablutions in a sacred lake, secret lake. This part of the Swavian nation extends in the most parts of Germany. Um, now what we've got here is a very, very tantalizing clue about Nerthos in this country. Because this chariot and the goddess loving her people and actually coming and visiting her people, is that reminiscent of something we still do today? We still have the May Queen. We still have the chariot with the May Queen going around the village. Yeah? So that clicked for me as being one clue that we could say Nerthos actually the whole religion resided in this country and we are unconsciously still honoring her in the way that we do. Back in those days their veneration was so much more because what Tacitus goes on to describe are a people who and I do believe in the writing you get the impression that his chin is on the deck over this. You imagine a Roman and he's watching these people who are so different but they are so sophisticated as well. In their ancient songs, which are the only records, they celebrate the god Twisto sprung from the earth and his son Manus as the fathers and founders of the race. To Manus they ascribe three sons whose names the people bordering on the ocean, 
And here we go again, boarding on the ocean. Are called the Ingavonis. Ingavonis are the people who live on the coastline. They become Frisians. They're the coastal people. They become the Dutch. Those inhabiting the central parts, Herminones and the rest, Istavones. So you can see that within our classification of Anglo Saxons, we are clubbing together a whole culture of people. And um, we, lo we do that. We, we just love to do that. We call it, we call the Jutes Jutes because they lived in Jutland. Jutland juts out. It's actually called the Kimbrick Peninsula. Assuming the license of antiquity actually affirmed that they were more descendants of the god from whom appellations were derived and those are of the Marsi, the Gambrivi, the Suevi and the Vandali and that these are genuine and religious original names. And so he actually says, that of Germany, on the other hand, they say, he says, and we're talking at 70 AD, is a modern addition. The men suppose sanctity and prescience inherent in the female sex. Now, if you know that Rome and their attitude to women is, is, is really basic, and, you know, they, they saw women as just objects. So Tacitus was looking at a, a race of people who said, therefore, they neither despise their counsels nor disregard their responses. So they saw women as equal. And this is coming from the horse's mouth here. There's no take on this. The Kantawara, Wiktwara and Mianwara, they were most advanced civilization of the nations of the Kimbrick Peninsula. Their love of liberty was paramount amongst their achievements. A Kentish man's liberty is his main characteristic from early, ever, early medieval times. This has come from the earliest Kantuara settlers, the people of Kant, Wickland, preserved through all of the Dark Ages, their free institutions which have survived today. There is perhaps no survival, the length and breadth of England that's more remarkable than this, because it dates back to that early. And these people from the Kimbrick Peninsula bought it here because they bought their sophisticated culture with them. I'm a Kentish lass and I'm damn proud of it now. I've got to say that. And I'm a free spirit. Well, everyone would say that, wouldn't they? <laughs> I'm a rebel. <laughs> I'm a free spirit. Um, <clears throat> so of the gods, the, the spirituality of these people, Mercury, the Romans called Woden Mercury is the principal object of their adoration to Hercules, Thunor, and Mars, Tiwa. They offer the animals usually allotted for sacrifice. Some of the Suevi also perform sacred rites to Nerthos, Isis. They conceive it unworthy, and this is crucial. They conceive it unworthy, the grandeur of celestial beings, to confine their deities within walls and to represent them a human similitude. Woods and groves are their temples and they affix names of that divinity to that secret power which they behold with the eye of adoration alone. So it, it actually means, if you, can, if you can imagine why the pagan peoples then didn't go into the Roman temples when they had the chance. Why they preferred to live in their wood buildings. It's because they chose to do that because they felt closer to their gods and goddesses, the spirits, the sprites, and they didn't want to change. Why not? Why not? We, we look at them because we, <coughs> we have been uh, presented with these people as being ruthless barbarians. And so our take on them is, oh, well, they're too barbarian to want to go and live civilised lives. But I'm presenting a different look, a different way of looking at them because I don't believe that they were barbarians in any way, shape or form. Of course they went to war and of course they were on the battlefield and there were moments when there was a lot of fighting going on. But inherently, they were people so close to Nerthos and people of peace that... They lived where they wanted to, and that was near the earth, the earth mother. I just wanted to ask you, um, 
Tacitus, didn't he chronicle the uh, Druidic uh, situation on the island as well? I haven't come across that. Oh, oh okay. Um, yeah, um, he, I think he also said that uh, Anglesey was their training ground. So I was just thinking about the nymphs and spirits and the... Oh, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That, oh, I have yeah. not... When I come to yeah. talk about the book, I have not discounted the Druid presence yeah. on the island yeah. at all because I've heard the, 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 the legends mm. about the Druids here and I've honoured yeah. them. Yeah, no, I just wanted... To yeah, no, it's... Yeah. Um, no people were more addicted to divination by omens and lots. The latter is performed in the following manner, and here we're talking about Woden's tr uh, Rods of Glory and the runes. The latter is performed in the following manner. They cut twigs from a tree, divide them into small pieces, which distinguish by certain marks the runes, are thrown, and I love this word, promiscuously, isn't that just so Roman? Promiscuously upon a white garment. The priest of the canton, if the occasion is public or private, the master of the family, after an invocation of the gods with his eyes lifted up to the heavens, thrice takes out each piece as they come up and interpret their significance according to the marks fixed upon them. So Tacitus is actually describing the use of runes from Woden and their use in a very in, in th throughout the you know throughout the whole tribe so in common with other nations the swervi are acquainted with the practice of auguring from notes and flights of birds but it is compute com peculiar to them to derive adon missions and presages from horses also certain of these animals milk white and untouched of earthly labor are pastured at public expense in sacred woods and groves. These, yoked to a consecrated chariot, are accompanied by the priest or king or chief person of the community who attentively observe the manner of neighing and snorting, and no kind of augury is more credited, not only among the populace, but among the nobles and priests, as the latter consider themselves as ministers of the gods and of horses, the privy to the divine will. That is totally with the Witwara and the Swavi. Um, that is something that really blew my mind when I was actually writing this because while I was writing the book, I was having information coming through, which I'll describe why later. And I was thinking, I'm not writing this. I'm really not writing this. And when I finished that particular part of the book, and I'm not going to be a plot spoiler, but those horses are there as the white auguries. And I just, yeah, I love that part of the book. Um, I had to check up on it to get that footprint. Because one of the things is when you're writing a fiction book, a historical fiction, you have a responsibility to find as much factual evidence as you can to support what you're writing about. Therefore, there has been a huge amount of research that's taken years um, there's also a wonderful inclusion that they don't see time and day as we do at all. Back then, they were honouring the twilight and the night. They honoured that more than they did the day. The day was for working in the fields, but the night was for doing sacred work. And they always talked in twilights, and they always talked in moons. And it's the one thing that got Tacitus uh, quite irate, actually, is because they wouldn't do anything with a Gregorian calendar. They had to wait for three or four moons before they would do a meeting because it was auspicious. And in their ceremonies and rites, they always employed the nicht galas, the night singers. And those night singers are the spacona, those are the priestesses and they would come and they would sing all night long if they needed to and they would call in the gods and goddesses through their singing and it's one of the things that I found really really interesting is that it's the vocal sounds that are important and why they we look at runes but we don't I mean some of us who study runes know that there is a sound a vocal sound to the runes <coughs> and that sound 
actually brings the runes into a sentient being. It brings them alive. It's the use of sound that calls out to spirit. And our people, our indigenous ancestors, were so adept at that. So the Nikdgalas were a very, very um, important role that they played. So, we have the victors. Let's go to this bit about his story and her story. Because I've spoken about how the Wiktuara, the Kantawara and the Mianwara were with the Earth Mother and they were honouring the feminine principle in a huge way. But the victors write the history. So you have Gildas, the Murdoch, calling them barbarians and everything else in between. Um, and what's quite staggering is we're coming to... Could you actually pull that over, Mitch, for us? This is just shows you, I'm actually going way beyond myself here. Um, that shows you where the Kimbrick Peninsula is. And this is where they settled. This is uh, Kent, Canterbury Brig, or Kent, Canterbury Brig, uh, Wiktuara and Mianwara. And this is where they settled. Specifically why, I ask myself. Yeah, Why did they do that? Um, we'll get on to bead in a minute because uh, we're coming to, is that two? Oh, here's, here's the old island, yeah. I've got plates of this here you can have a look at. But just to give you a clue that, you know, these are all of the Saxa, so the sorry, Suave names of the island as they have been researched and you can see we've got this is the old island you see we've got two distinct islands you were talking about the druid yeah mm -hmm. and these are the legends that the druid occupied these two islands yeah sure yeah yeah, yeah yeah and this is freshwater Ireland and that is a uh, Everland Everland Ireland and Oram is the old name for Benbridge and uh, we have Steve Sinclair, which is the old name for Shanklin, Kiefer Doon, uh, it's Chessel, Laffer Doon is Garston Down. So all of these, all of these are the original names, and it's in the book. But these two islands, yes, did you know? And I'm jumping here, but it's quite interesting. Um, after the massacre, there were escapes but I'm going to get that to that later about how in ineffectual genocide is. But it is known that King Alfred, who was very fond of the island, whose mother was an islander, so we have that mitochondrial DNA carrying on despite everything, he brought that island under royal charter. Why? I'm asking that question, why? Because... Um, he did, and it's totally distinct. Braiding was actually open to the Solent completely. That's, and there's a whole different, there's a whole other story attached around Braiding Villa, which we'll probably not have time to talk about. <coughs> but um, I wanted to give you this, because the other question is, why did they come here? What brought them here? where they could have gone all over the place. I mean, I do know that their land wasn't very fertile. I mean, they lived in forest and lakes. They were pastoralists completely. But you had areas of famine. You had, um, there were floods. We know that they were being threatened from the east. And so their lives must have been a case of thwarted paradise, I would call it, actually, to be honest. And they'd heard about the agriculture, they'd heard about the wheat growing, which they didn't have an awful lot there. So I want to take a look because being totally uh, in tune with the energies, totally in tune with Earth Mother, this is the Kimbrick Peninsula, this is the Michael and Mary line going down here and that takes you to Lake Tikikaka and that's 
St. Michael's Island there. So all of these things are very, very important. And you have uh, the Bolinus line coming through here. Did they feel those energies? What brought them? They must have felt those energies. I think they did. I think that if they were people who had moved across continents when the ice melted, they would have felt those energies. And so I think that it brought them over here and said, yeah, this is where we've got to go. And that's where they came. And of course, Kent is the closest. Uh, my feeling is that quite a few of them hugged the coast and then came over this way, the shortest way. But we do know that the Wiktwara and also the Mianwara were the priestly caste. They were the people who came, who were the Spakonas. Why? Because this island is so special. You know, they really saw this island as sacred. The Druids came here. Why did they come here? Because this island is sacred. And we have had all of that history suppressed from us because... And I have to tell you, I am an agnostic Christian, but I'm not a fundamentalist Christian. And I have so much I have to say about fundamental anything. But it was fundamental Christianity that actually suppressed all of this to a hugely deep degree until it's been erased. But... No, it hasn't been erased at all. <laughs> um, this is the Bolinus line, as you know. I'm sure you're very aware. <coughs> this is an old one. This is the 1974 Guy Raglan Phillips's Bolinus line. We know that... Um, it's moved slightly, hasn't it? Um, it's changed. It, I will say that this is an old map. Yeah. This one has changed quite significantly with all the work that Gary Biltcliffe has done. Um, and so I'm saying that right now. The one reason why I've included this is purely from a personal point of view. I lived at Core Abbey, just off from Core Abbey at Binney Hall. I've only just recently found out that the Bolinus line, or is it the Ellen line, actually runs through there. The line is, is just past it, um, but the actual energy, the dragon Bolinus. Yeah, because I spent... Yeah, I, was, I lived there for so eight years and it was during those eight years that I did all my training. And I can tell you, that place is unbelievable for going through the veil. Unbelievable for witnessing things more there than I, than I did in Native America, actually, in Pipestone. I had more happening here, which just shows you. And Chuck Derby, the leader of the Sistan Dakota Sioux, came over to the island several times because he thought the place was pretty cool. <laughs> anyway, um, this, this triangle here is just a personal thing because when I went to Avebury, I touched the stones and I had another a vision given me there of smelting iron. I smelt smelting iron and I saw who was there. That was an experience. And also at Glastonbury. So I've got a feeling that there is a trinity accorded here with the island, with Avebury and Glastonbury. And I've called it the Earth Trinity. This is, this is the Venerable Bede. The Venerable Bede wrote the E-class e e of history of Britain. I can't say it. <clears throat> and he wrote centuries after the fact. But about him, there is an interesting inclusion in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. Because out of all the things that he's written, he did take... He did take uh, Gildas the Murdoch and took some of his stuff and put it into his Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, which kind of cemented the idea that this, they were barbarians and they were raping and killing and doing all sorts of things. And so when you move on to that, he did something very unusual, and I will maintain that it's unusual, although there, there's, well, people are trying to form royal dynasties all over the place to be royal. But... Bede actually made a statement about it and Stephen Oppenheimer picked up on it. So I have a quote from him that kind of really made me think, were we housing just more than a peaceful Nethos worshipping people? Did we actually have royalty here? So 
He says yes. Or at least he intimates that it's yes. The Venerable Bede, let me give you a little backstory on him. He, he entered the monastery of St Peter and Paul in Jarrow in Northumbria when he was seven years old and he never left. Okay? Um, with that in mind, his masterwork being the ecclesiastical history of the English people known as the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, which it will be from now on, he had to please the king who had commissioned the work and he was duty bound to please the Christian church. In 731 was heavily Gregorian. Uh, those Gregorian missionaries had come over and done an awful lot of work, which I'll come to in a minute with a fabulous book of Tuellen Penry. I do recommend her to you to read. She is fabulous in her pairing away all of this Christmas, Chris, Christian dogma to find the Anglo-Saxon magic underneath. It's an incredible book. And it has helped me enormously in writing this. Um, he, he had a small army of monks to report to him from all over the country with oral stories, myth and fact all mixed in together. And one of those was Wilfred. Well, we'll be hearing about him later. Not good. Regarding the bloodline of Woden to the Wiktwara, Bede uncharacteristically for a devout Christian monk stepped in from his comfort zone to say this. The first two commands are said to have been Hengist and Horsa. They were the sons of Victgillus, Whitgill, whose father was Witter, or they say Witter in Roman, and that's important, whose father was Vector. Okay, if you think of Vector, but it was Vector who was the son of Woden, whose stock of the royal race for many deduced their original. So you've got Wickleek, you've got Whitguy, you've got Whitgills, all of them Wicked. Wickland, join the dots. Well, I did, and I really, really believe that we have a royal bloodline to Woden on the island. Uh, from Stephen Oppenheimer, we still honour Woden's name in variants of the word Stem Wednesday. And I'll do a little bit more on that from uh, Twell and Penry. Place names on days of the week. Uh, and so we read in book one of the Anglo-Saxon, from this Woden road arose all the royal kindred. This text from the oldest surviving English history was no routine description of an accident of descent, but a deliberate statement. The gap between each of the main founders and Woden is but a few generations. For instance, the Udose leader, Whitgills, whose name attached to the Isle of Wight is claimed to be the father of Hengist and Horsa, who would have made him already resident in the British Isles when they invaded. And more than that, I found more evidence that Witter was always in this country and he fought in Scotland and was living in Britain. So the Romans, and this is another thing, <laughs> It's one of my favourites, but it's just a summation, actually. The Romans never pronounced the W. They always changed it to a V. And so we have Vita instead of Witter in, the, in the, uh, the stone up in Scotland that they were writing about him, which proves he was there. If you replace the W in Wector, you get Vector. Vectus, Wickland... Were the Romans particularly honouring the island, uh, honouring the island with a royal name? It's all of these things are kind of new to us, to hanging in the air. I can't prove it, but I think that there is some evidence there to say that could be possible. So, if that's the case, that we did have royals here on the island, as well as our priestly nation of the Wiktwara, then that makes it even more probable that they wanted to get rid of the royals and they used Christianity to do it. Pope Gregory sent his missionaries to the British shores and could be regarded as some kind of invasion in itself, actually. Um, their mission was to convert the pagan people to Christianity by coercion, propaganda, inventive coercion, which means they got crafty about it, and then brute force. Um, in 635, their mission had converted the pagans in southern Britain except 
for Wickland, except for here. They were devout pagans. They did apostate for a while, but then they came back again, and there they stayed. So, Twell and Penry, The Magic World of the Anglo-Saxons. All of these books I've brought in. You can see it's a working book. I'm not precious. You know, they're well used. <laughs> They've got more post-its on these than <laughs> a post-it board. Anyway, uh, that's how I work. Um, okay, Burchard, his priest to ask erstwhile obedient flock. Almost all surviving evidence were written from a Christian point of view, designed to show heathen people as ignorant, superstitious and pathetically grateful for being converted to a new religion. I don't think so. Because there's another spin. Burchard asks his priest to ask his erstwhile obedient flock, have you mixed any lethal poison and killed anyone lately? Have you burned down a church and approved of it? And this actually is written in. That's what they had to ask the congregation. So they invented what was called the penitentials. Now the penitentials was the instrument, psychological, that they used to suppress absolutely, layer by layer by layer, all of the pagan beliefs. And it was called the corrector. Widespread prohibition of burning graves where a man has died, prohibition of using bread as charms or magic while bread was absolutely sacred to Woden, so Christians had to resort to stamping the cross on buns. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Prohibition of weather magic, he quotes in his of greed and other vices, those of you who practice auguries, and I put in here Moomin and Hugin, which are the, the ravens of Woden, uh, and divinations, and those who let loose tempests. Well, it was known that women practice weather magic. The church focused harshly on women, as women were the caretakers of magical law and practice. So weather magic, yes, they did, and they could, and they did. Uh, yet the Christogram, which is the IHS used by the clergy, double standards here, they could use that for magic, at the hands of the clergy was fine. It happened with Wilfred when he was down in Sussex trying to convert the pagans there and they were having drought and famine and goodness knows what and he produced his Christogram and hey, rain came. So he was a saviour and that was how the South pagans in Sussex became Christian through that one thing alone, him using the Christogram. So, Prohibition, oh, this is interesting. Prohibition of placing a sick child on a warm oven. Now, think about it. If you were back then and it was the middle of winter and your child was burning up for you, what would you do? You'd find, try and warm him up. So it's perfectly, perfectly logical for a mother, not with a burning oven, but with a warm oven, to put the child on the oven to break the fever. So they stopped that as well. Uh, prohib oh no, this is, this is prohibition, condemnation of people who released vows at trees. God oaks sacred to Thunor. Missionaries systematically cut them down. So if you're looking at the, at the perpetrator of how our oaks disappeared from this country, look to those missionaries because that's what they did. They cut our oaks down. Even St Boniface personally took an axe to the Donna Oak before he inflicted himself on Wickland. Prohibition of pagan rituals even in private. So you have this snooper energies born, you know, this snooping of other people. They got to that point. And then of course they built churches over sacred sites church was determined to weaken Woden's influence as it was the feminine goddess Nethos. So they renamed Wands Dyke, which is Woden's mound, and almost certainly built before the Anglo-Saxons were purported to come. So we have evidence that they were here before 420. And built, uh, renamed it the Devil's Ditch. So look to here. What have we got here? What have we got here? <laughs> The Devil's Punch Bowl, which is a major, major, major energy point, vortex point. It's a bowl. Great, yeah, isn't it? yeah. So they called it the Devil. 
So doesn't that make you? Mm. And they also said, they also said that the Devil's Wit Ditch was built by the devil on a Wednesday, which is Woden's Day. So all of this propaganda was actually built end on end on end until you get to the demonizing of feminine plants that heal. So you get these, you get these wonderful healer women, these women, yeah, who were called witches. They, there's another story to the witch, isn't it? Maybe we can do that in a minute. And they demonize the feminine plants by calling them mother die plants. So all the wo love wooden enemies, all of those plants with the beautiful white flowers that are healing were called mother die. So they were banned in an instant. And Woden's nine herbs as well. Uh, prohibition of burning lights near trees, rocks, cross roads and springs. So that's the story of how her story was suppressed. And it makes really, really tough reading, I've got to say. So in counterbalancing that, and of course we come to Wilfred, I'm coming to the point now where it gets to Wilfred and Kudwala. Ah, there he is. Kudwala the mercenary. Whew. Saint Kudwala. Saint Kudwala. <laughs> Okay, I've got a, I've got a really good piece to say about Saint Cadwalla in a minute. Anyway, we've, we're on Wilfred still. Uh, 633 to 709 AD. He was born a Northumbrian noble and studied at Linda's farm. He was ostentatious, hungry for power and wealth, travelled with a huge retinue of men and made enemies of kings who expelled him. That's our St Wilfred. He was exiled from northern England and went south to harry the pagans in Sussex. The first thing he did was kill a pagan priest. The second thing he did, because there was famine and plague, used a Christogram and everything turned around for him. And that is a huge, massive double standard by anybody's standard. So we come to Cadwalla, because I'm condensing it here, because this whole story of Wilfred and Cadwalla and Wolf Hare comes in the third book. It's not going to be an easy write. I haven't got there yet. So I'm condensing it now. So you have to come back in a year's time when I finish the third one. Anyway, Cadwalla, he was said to be a descendant of, of King Kirwilin of Wessex, but that's debatable. He was sent to Oxford. He became a mercenary. He was violent and cruel. When Cadwalla and Wilfred met, there must have been a mutual joining of sick souls, as I've called it. Together they compounded the more intense conversion. They both, oh, I didn't get that. They both hungered for power and wealth. Cadwalla wanted through sheer conquest to become the Britvalda, that is king of kings. That was his motive. Wilfred's was quite another. Invading Wickland was a joint plan. Cadwalla would succeed in killing the royal dynasty here, which I'll come to in a minute, and in massacring the whole island was Wilfred's plan, would hand it over to Christian Saxons. Cadwalla handed over a full quarter of the island to St Wilfred, just like that. So this is what, he was wounded during the massacre, yes went to Rome to compound his glory with a sainthood and died there. It's wonderful. F I got this. Uh, <laughs> great. Cadwalla was a Saxon king who kept expanding his influence by killing off other kings and forcibly taking their kingdoms. The historian Bede tells of Cadwalla, and Bede here is really good, going through the countryside by merciless slaughter. But then he went on a pilgrimage and presumably started to feel bad for all the slaughter. Then he got baptised, after which he died, which technically makes him the patron saint of remorseful serial killers. <laughs> <laughs> so, finally, we come off the history to her story. Um, I hope you've been able to follow it. It's a huge amount to take in. For me, it was awesome to be able to put this together so that I could put my foot on the ground and say, yes, 
this was how it was. We have an indigenous people here called the Witwara who spoke Anglo-Saxon, and I'll be speaking a bit of it in a minute, um, and who were peaceful, wonderful people. And they're here still, walking with us, as we know, because genocide doesn't work, because I'm here to tell you it doesn't, because I am related to them. My name, Whale, used to be something that was made fun of when I was at school, catch up whale. My dad used to say, well, it's old Saxon. Um, I come from a race of huge people. My dad was six foot four, and my nephew is nearly seven foot. And when I was teaching at Osborne, because the tribe of whales is few and far between, but we are here, they didn't kill us. There was a girl that came into my classroom when I was teaching year six. And she just had to duck her head to get into the door. She was huge. And I looked at her and I smiled and I thought, God, I recognise you. And I said, what's your name? And she says, oh, I'm Lucy Whale. <laughs> and I went to discover that Whale is actually spelt Wal, which is W-A-H-L. And you'll find that the heroine in the book, the make, is called Wal not associated with me, but in some ways, maybe. Um, there are a family of whales still in Avebury Truslow, and there are a family of whales still in Titchfield, which is where the Meehan Valley is, still today. And the name Wal actually stands for Guardian of the Stones. <sighs> and... I spent a good two years of my life travelling around different countries, building stone circles for different people to come together. Iceland, Africa, uh, Israel, in Israel, very important one in Israel, in Jerusalem. And I didn't know why I was doing it and people thought I was bonkers. I just dropped my whole job. I left teaching, dropped my whole job, dropped everything. Just a rucksack. So I did this 20, 30, 40 years ago, honey. <laughs> anyway, um, and I didn't know why I was doing it, but now I do. And it's made a huge, huge difference to me about how I can put this across to you because everything has a synchronicity, everything has a reason. There are no coincidences in this walk that we do. Everything has a meaning. Some of us don't know what that meaning is, but if some of us are lucky enough to find out what it is, that is treasure. That is pure treasure. So I'm very thankful to my ancestor to helping me do this because she has been walking with me. There's no doubt about it. And she continues and she walks with people who have a connection also. And she is sentient. And what she wants more than anything else is for us to honor our ancestors. Because there is a phrase that came through, it said, we only die when people forget us. And it's true. Now, for those Wiktwara and for the people who lived here, they were forced into this loss of memory from us. And it's my passion to actually get as many people as I can on this island who feel that pull to spirit to honour our ancestors because then they will be at peace. Shall I read a bit from the book? <laughs> yeah. There's a passage here that I really love. And um, it's about the Nifgalas singing to the whole ceremony for the naming of Woden, because he came through as a, as a child god, his demigod. <coughs> the full moon sent shafts of luminous light 
onto the surface of a pool that was still like glass. The night world held its breath. The women sat in silence with only the rustle of threads being tied to the small looms each woman held on the ground. Threads of amber, crimson and dark blue and green lay on the crisp frost lace grass in readiness for the weaving. The singers sat away from the women on the ridge above. Frida, most of all, shone in the moonlight. She radiated a pulse most unique, and Huld loved her for that. Leaves were silhouetted in a silver sheen, for the night goddess, Mani, was gracing them with all the fullness of a cloudless sky, with many stars and a moon to truly sing to, and so they began. Vesu hail Foldemodor, Framphilas, et thu nethos, Althan thesun awexi an theol, in nethos ondwedness, Willan he beyond fin frondlik, on wisdom el, in frihold on inferos. Hail to thee, earth mother of mortal men, to thee, Nerthos, grant thy son grow strong in Nerthos' presence, willing he to be filled with your love and wisdom, strong in body and in mind. And then the Elder Mordor, she wants to make those weird rapaths for Woden to become really sacred. This is about powering them up. And in the old ways, it would be what they call a reduction magic. So they come from this to this. And so many women had been brushing, clearing, cleaning the lodge for two whole days. It was just two twilights in the dark moon. She was waning, sliver of light, as Hodges lit looked up to see the clouds scudding past in an impatience she could feel in her soul. Gisa, she thought, but we're running close to the wind here, my Nerthos. The journey to the top of the mountain would take at least two twilights. How would the child god fare on that journey? She knew not. And she had to arrive by the first appearing of Muna, their beloved moon goddess, and not a minute after. It depended much on the skill of Frida, who had made the journey with Huld. She herself had collected the jewel girdle and the talk of Nerthos, kept in a secret place only she knew. Soon, she thought, this must be shared, for I'll be joining my ancestors. She had cleaned them with a dew collected that morning, and now she placed the weird rapace weavings before her. Only now, in the moonshine, did they come alight. She rubbed the magical dew in, singing softly, Niga dropper et cleansianthu, et a dropper et helanthu, surf on dropper et wiothan de followe, six dropper a lukanthu, fifth dropper a gifanthu reo, fifth dropper et asmianthu blios, dwarth dropper et asmian thu friogon menes, a dropper a gifanthu frigan. Nine drops to cleanse you, eight drops to heal you, seven drops to throw demons away, six drops to charm you, five drops to give you voice, four drops to make you joyful, three drops to make you courageous, two drops to make you love humanity, and one drop to give you love. Thank you, everybody. This is the part of the ancient, ancient land here where, as Tacitus remarked, there was an island that had a sacred grove to Nerthos. And we've always imagined that this grove actually was here on the Isle of Wight. And I would like to think that this 
beautiful piece of water here if you imagine that those houses are not there if you can imagine that this would be occupied by the most ancient trees because all of this part of the island back in the old ancient days was forest this could have been the grove of Nerthos and so that part of it which was honoured by the Wiktwara when they did their procession to honour Nerthos could have come here and they could have been honouring the ancient oak, the dragon oak as it's called, here that we're going to visit in a minute. This beautiful ancient oak has been called the dragon oak and it is one of the most beautiful ancient trees we have on the island. It's hidden. We can, we, 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 we can honour it in such a beautiful way but one of the things that I love about this oak apart from the fact that her heartbeat is so strong and she is so old, she's bent her branches down and you can put yourself to the branches and you can feel the whole oak tree move with you. You're actually with the oak tree as it moves. So you can get to her energy and to her heart so easily. And it's for our children and our children's children to come and really, really enjoy and be with this oak. That's why she has brought her branches down, her huge chunks down for the children. It's a children's oak tree. And I have come here to create essences before and now to honour the energy of her. I really believe that she may not be the original that our ancestors came to honour, as I have written in the Wiktwara, but this is a sibling of the original tree. I believe that this oak tree has been here for aeons. And you can feel how old she is. And I've got an essence just over there. I've traveled that branch when I had the legs to do it, which I don't anymore. <laughs> and sat within that there as I have seen children sit in there and just enjoy being with nature. Yeah, it's a wonderful, wonderful tree. first time that I came here decades ago and I was walking up the Fossway I met this V here and it's so often that spirit give you a choice do you go left or do you go right and I've had this up at Glastonbury as well to find our sacred places and because I'm left-handed I went left <laughs> And it took me way out of the way, yeah? So I had to come and trace myself back and take the right way. And that takes you up to the long stone. And it's made me laugh because they've actually put a sign up there now saying this is to the long stone. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 yeah, it's a bit of a joke, really, because you go up there and you do reach it. So it's, it's this choice. Spirit yeah. gives you choices, left or right. Let's go right, shall we? Yeah, that's right. <laughs>
beautiful, beautiful, beautiful December day. Um, and I'm here at our ancient Longstone. And this forms such an important part of the whole Victoire story because the lead character in it, Dagger and Wall, is a guardian of the stones, as am I and my people before me. And we came to realise and to understand the spirit aspect of the stone, that it is a record keeper. And that record keeper means that it holds the memories and stores the events that happen around it. And for me, and as I have found out since other people now have bought and read the book, they've come to me absolutely, incredibly um, enthous well, enthusiastic, but, but committed, saying, Jan, I've had this happen to me at the Longstone. I've seen the pictures. I've seen the vision that you've described in the book, which I shall be describing shortly. And that it means that people have witnessed in the past what happened here, the huge, huge massacre in 686 by Kedwala and Wilfrid, who came to kill all the people here because they were pagan, because they would not give up their goddess Nerthos, because they honoured and nurtured the land and lived so close to nature that the kind of Roman Catholicism that they were being presented with, they could not relate to the one God and not actually honouring the world and the nature as it should be for them. And so this happened in 686 and people are remembering it, which begs the question, our ancestors are still alive they are still sentient, they're walking this land, and are we related to them? The people that have come to me saying, well, I remember this so well, was I here then, and I'm remembering it again? So these are huge big questions that I had, don't have the answer for myself, but I do know in my, in my spirit that <coughs> my bloodline of the while does go back to ancient Saxon times, and I do feel that these were my ancestors and so I'm reliving and giving their history, their her story to people now so that they can be honoured again. And so I've had pictures, visions, whatever you like to call it in our English language, sighting here at the Longstone. I've had it at Avebury and I've had it at Glastonbury. And these are ancient sacred places. And again, it comes to understanding that the stones are the record keepers. And I know that sounds kind of bland to say the record keepers, but to be absolutely scientific about it, all of the standing stones from Stonehenge to Avebury to the single stone that's still in Glastonbury and this long stone here has a base of quartz. Now quartz, is a transceiver, a transmitter, and a transducer, which means that it is an amplifier of what happens around it. And we have it in every single computer that we use these days. It's based on quartz. And so our ancestors had their own computer. And to record it and to keep it for this long is absolutely amazing but if you have the energy and you're linked you will see and you will know and so <clears throat> I wanted to read a short passage about the Wiktwara and how they came to be and how the stone and the stone circle was incredibly important to them Mona's full face was shimmering down at me in a cloudless night sky. Her face was clear and I felt my words to her jostle for supremacy. Bring peace, peace for our people. Let the reign of Elifa be honourable and just. Protect him and my family. All these feelings tumbled around my head until I realised the inner chaos. I was the one that needed peace. Trauma had settled on my soul, sitting there waiting for release, and no one but myself could let it go. 
I was alone <clears throat> in the willow copse, whose branches stretched over to hide and protect our ancestor circle. I pushed my palms into the warm earth, feeling the moist soil push up and surround my hands. I needed to bring my soul back, <clears throat> to be with the rhythm of the Earth Mother. Her song I could not hear, yet until that came back to me and travelled with me, I could not be the Spicona this night. I needed to prepare for the ancestors, so I needed to be ready. I hit the earth with my full face down, taking a deep breath inward. Love washed over me. Then the rhythm began, the low pulse that became louder, then softer. When it was echoing waves within me, I slowly got up, eyes closed to keep the inner focus and felt my way to the circle. Each ancestor stone had a sound, unique and unalterable. As I touched each stone, that sound came and I held it, humming softly to myself. Then another and another, until I was singing the ancestor's song. I went to the centre where the singing standing stone stood upright, pointed close to Mona. Placing my hands hard on him, the cool and pitted rough stone patterned on the palm of my hands, and I sang with full resonance into his centre. Then he answered back with a full echo. My head was clear, my heart at peace, and there I remained until Saga and Nichtgala joined me there with Lifa. We sang the ancestor song together, helping each other to remain completely focused. The thing had begun. King Wichlid arrived with a leafer at his side. It was a mark of respect that he saw him as his equal. Large torches carried by the people brought a staggering light to the circle, and I fought to keep the focus. Everyone wore the Suevi knot, some braided with prayers to Nerthos, Woden, or Thunar, and all came in complete solemnity, for this was our ancestors' home. There were representatives from all the tribes. Wichlid walked to the singing stone and raised his hands to the night sky. We hushed our song to a whisper, never stopping. We walked away from the centre to allow Aching of Wickland to speak. Monagense in Suni Bregan Thinet, it bletsi and thit folder erir. So now we stand on an airy and frep thin bletsunga from rain it ur bewetsen. Woden for Elferda, through our fail for Inga, from Thuok Hilland, Scope, Unkiman, Thin Blood Kenan, Thur Thin Ethora, Un Doctor, He on Wichland, we airy and through Thecknicht. As well on Urhatan, et Nimnian, Un Theonskeep, and Threos, Un Enes. Mona, consort to Sune, bring your power to bless the earth, our land. Thunor, we stand in honour of your blessings of rain on our crops. Woden, all father, you are our beloved ancestor of tested warriors, healers, poets and negotiators. Your blood runs through our sons and daughters here on Wickland. We honour you this night. Answer our call to name our people in unity and peace. Gise, 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 came murmuring through the circle of Esuevi host, standing in reverence within the ancestor stone circle. Each group was holding a torch. The flames flickered in the slight breeze, casting a dance of shadows over the stones. Faces half illuminated look expectantly at our king. Suddenly, a harsh wind blew up from nowhere, and within that rush, a raven swooped down to sit on the apex of the singing stone, directly above the head of Wicklied, who gave the rarest, broadest smile anyone had seen for him in many a moon. His further had arrived. People gasped, one man fell to his knees, praying to Woden for even rain and even sun to bring a good harvest. It was ever-present prayer of my kinsman. The winter was nearing and the winter was close. Who amongst you wishes to speak with our Elferdo? Wicklid intoned loudly, his face sweeping the circle. Hesitantly, an aging Gwen, shuffling from the shadows. Her frail, wispy hair was tied in a tight, swavian knot, yet still it trailed nearly to her waist as she swayed as she hobbled forward. 
She grasped a staff in her white knuckled bony hand. Her hair held one single braided prayer, intertwined with blue and turquoise thread. She was Nerthos in mortal form, and she surely had something to say. My lord, she intoned in a soft, lilting voice as she bowed to Wicklead, who in turn bowed in respect to her. She turned her gaze upwards, a shining glaze layer over her eyes. She considered the night, even above the raven, who stared at her intently, not moving a feather. A moment of complete stillness radiated around the circle. O oh, Father, my deepest love goes to you, child god of beloved Nerthos, she who honours us and makes this island home sacred. We are abounding in all the good fates. The weird swims easily here, yet it cannot always be so. Ill fortune awaits us, and knowing this, we unite in strength to heal and make good our weakest link. That weakest link is our ancestors may be forgotten in the changing of our tribe's common name. My children will know and honour the new name, but on their lips I will teach our real name, Avione. And their children's children will know that Avione is where we come from. Our numbers are small here. Most of the seven tribes are still over the Germania Sea. What will they make of this? Loud murmurings of Gise, Gise. Yes, yes, swept around the circle. Accepted, called Weirford loudly. Let this be passed also, that we all honour our old tribal names for the generations to come. Let this not be our weakest link, but the strongest. For under these stones lay the ancestors who are Avione, Rudigminians, Angli, Warini, Yodosi, Sirconi, Neothone. We honour you and we remember you all. A great cheer arose. Wickley turned to us, motioning us forward, for it was now the time to sing the ancestors' song. We had been quietly humming the tones. We were practised now. We each intoned the sacred frequency note, long or interrupted, sweeping high, then low. Then we harmonised until the whole circle was thrumming in an earth vibration. This was the ancestors' song, given from the stones. The people began to join in until the whole sacred circle was sending back their echo. We went into trance, and after a while, the song began to change of itself. We were singing the notes differently, but still all in unison. The power built up, the energy radiant. We Wiktwara. The raven called loudly, flew low over to the circle, then swooped up and away. Wiktwara, the king shouted. Our name is now Wiktwara. Let it be so. So on this first night of the full moon, the Swavian tribes of Wickland became the united hosts of the Wiktwara. <laughs> a walk down from the Longstone <coughs> to this area of land here called Grammar's Wood. It's privately owned wood. It's a red squirrel conservation area. But back in 686 AD, it was a huge, huge battleground. This is where the massacre of the Wiktwara took place. The warriors from Wessex came with Kudwala over that ridge in their hundreds, thousands, they just came over the ridge and the Wiktwara ran to here and this is where a lot of the killing took place in this area here and it was bloody and it was terrible and the dead were taken to that area over there where the trees are 
and this is part of island law. It's it's come into into the island legend, where this place has become known as the Black Barrow, and that the dead were placed over there in a huge barrow that stretches quite a long way. But it has never been excavated because it is private land. And so, us islanders always regard the Black Barrow as a place where we go to pray for those who were killed that day and to try and bring peace to them. I have been up there in ceremony on several occasions and I have felt the energy there. Um, and we'll keep doing that along with my friends. And this is the whole part of the story that needs to be brought out and for people to know about the Wiktwara, how wonderful culture it was, who they were. And uh, that's, my, that, that's my passion, to bring that awareness to people of the island, to the schools, to the community. They will know of the Wiktwara, and that's my job done. Thank you. Thank you.